A very warm welcome to you. It's so great to be with you this morning. Our scripture comes from Psalm 91, and I'm reading from verse 1 to 6. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. Psalm 91 is a scripture that a lot of people have turned to over the last couple of months, perhaps because it really speaks to our current situation. I think we can all identify with that verse 6 that speaks about the pestilence that stalks in darkness. And so the psalm is a prayer that many Christians have been praying over themselves and their families, and it really is a beautiful prayer of faith, a declaration. But it's also challenging because um, while it speaks about God's protection and how he will protect those who hide in the shelter of his wings, we know that this doesn't always, our faith in God doesn't always protect us from experiencing difficulties or pain or harm. And the end of the psalm is very telling. If you read the end of it, it speaks about how he says, because God loves me, I will call to him and he will answer me and he will be with me in my trouble. Not I will rescue him from all his trouble, which honestly, I think we would prefer if God said that, but God says he will be with us in our trouble. But today I want to just talk about um, read the first two verses of the psalm. Today is about not trying to figure out why bad things happen or all of that really complicated stuff. But I was led back to the psalm this week and I really got stuck in the first two verses and they really have just spoken to me so deeply. Truth be told, I'm not coping all that well um, with the uncertainty of the world at the moment and I'm sure I'm not the only one. I'm a very risk-averse person and we live in now an extremely high-risk world where everything is about risk management and nothing really seems to be clear, nothing seems to be certain and my soul so desperately just needs some simple instructions, a step-by-step -step guide, the dummy's guide to life in 2020 if you will. And everything seems so enormously complex and difficult, I just want God to kind of give me a blueprint. I'm a rule follower, so I know not everyone's like that, but I like to know what the parameters are and then I know what to do. And I feel like at the moment no one knows what the parameters are. Um, and so when I came across the psalm again, when I was led back here this week, it really spoke to me so deeply. Because the Christian faith, unfortunately, for some of us, um, isn't really a step-by-step -step plan. God doesn't, you know, he gives us some pretty specific instructions and the Ten Commandments and Kind of the way that we're supposed to live and there's some really concrete things but most of the, the Christian faith is an invitation to a relationship it's to look at the person of Jesus and to figure out how does he live how does he respond to things how do I through relationship with him and then by the power of the Holy Spirit live out a different kind of life and um, but back to Psalm 91 when I, I read this this week I found these four verbs and um, that really speak to my heart and I hope that they speak to yours today. I've been doing grade one homeschooling so I'm very into um, doing words at the moment and that's maybe why they stuck with me. But I've really also been trying to focus on spiritual health because there's obviously a lot of talk about physical health and we're all doing what we can to keep physically healthy and all the extreme measures that that involves at the moment. And there's some talk about mental health and how our current situation is really difficult on our mental health. But I just want to focus today for a moment on our spiritual health. And for me, this has just been so helpful this week. It's like a practical to-do list of four verbs, four doing things that I can practically do and put in place in my life that speak to what I need to do to stay spiritually healthy, not just right now, but especially in this season. So let's read those first two verses again and see if you can spot those verbs. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Now there's so much in those two, two verses. There's the four verbs and you'll also notice there's four different 
names of God, which is so significant. Most High, Almighty, the Lord, and my God. And so there's so much packed in there. But today I just wanted to look at, at those four verbs and what they really speak to us about ways that we can draw near to God and that we can find rest in Him. So the first word is dwell. Dwell in the shelter of the Most High. Your dwelling really is the place where you live. It is a permanent fixture in your life. You dwell more, more so now than ever in your house. Um, and there's a reason that the scriptures use this word in this passage. Your dwelling place is the place where you permanently reside. There's a permanence about it. It's not the place you just pop into or out of. There's a significance about this is the place that I inhabit. And so we are invited to dwell in God's presence, not to run in and out of it, not to make the occasional visit, but to really dwell in his presence every moment of every day. Charles Spurgeon says it like this, every child of God looks toward the inner sanctuary and the mercy seat, yet not all dwell in the most holy place. They run into it and enjoy occasional approaches but they do not habitually reside in the mysterious presence. So what can you do differently? What can you continually do to inhabit the presence of God? It's not about just spending a few minutes in the morning and then kind of going on through your day or those occasional flickers of thoughts about God here and there. But it's really about training yourself to dwell in the presence of God, to live in it permanently. So one practical thing that I've been really trying to do is that I've been trying to use my negative emotions, and there are a lot of them at the moment, trying to use my negative emotions as cues to pray. And so when I feel things rising up against or inside of me, things um, like anxiety or fear or frustration or anger, um, I try to teach myself, there's a scripture that speaks about taking our thoughts captive. And so for me, that's really meant over the last while when I fear that stuff, when I feel that stuff rising up in me, that I take that thought captive and instead of letting myself dwell on all the things that usually come after that and my different worst case scenarios that my brain likes to play out in my head, I take that thought captive and I turn it into a prayer. And sometimes the things that are overwhelming me are really big things and big questions about life. And sometimes it's the never ending pile of washing. But either way, I can turn it into a prayer. And this doesn't have to be some big thee and thou, dear Lord, please empower me by thy spirit to do this washing. It can just be a breath. It can just be, Lord, I'm feeling overwhelmed. I need your help. On Alpha this week, we spoke about prayer. And one of the people who was speaking in the course spoke about there's three simple things for him when it comes to prayer. Keep it honest. Keep it simple. And keep it up and that's there's something so powerful about not having to really go into a really hectic frame of mind when we pray but just every time one of those negative emotions pop up just turn it into a prayer an honest one a simple one and keep that up throughout the day connect with God a couple of other things that we can do to practically dwell in the presence of God is to make sure that you give yourself some visual cues or things that are going to remind you to keep on seeking God to keep on inviting him into every aspect of your day. So whatever you're staring at, whether it's, um, you know, put something on your computer, a post-it note that just says pray, and just, it's a simple thing about every time you see it, just be reminded to invite God into that space. On your front door, on the steering wheel of your car, wherever it is on the fridge door, wherever it is that you're spending a lot of time looking at, remind yourself to engage with God and to dwell in his presence to keep on inviting him into the space that you inhabit. Another thing that you can do is listen to worship music, listen to podcasts or scripture or a whole lot of different things to focus your mind continually on the things of God. And then also to really end the day with gratitude and to look for the ways in which God has been working in your life. Do the things that really help you to, at the end of the day, to either talk to your family about it, perhaps at dinner time or write it down in a journal, or just at the end of the day when you are praying, to say to God, I just want to take a moment and think about what happened today and help me see where you were at work. 
And as we do that, we train ourselves to become more and more aware of God's presence. And so we teach ourselves to practically dwell with him. We have to keep making the conscious decision to dwell, to shelter ourselves in God. And you notice what, God, what the psalmist says here about who we are dwelling in. It is the presence of the Most High, of El Elyon, the Most High God. And so that's something that's really significant. We don't dwell in the presence of a God that is not able, of a God that is small, of a God that is distant. We dwell in the presence of the Most High high and powerful God, and therefore we can find rest in him. And that's the second verb that we come to, rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Now, this is a hard one for me because I'm not good at resting at the best of times, and especially at the moment, um, it's really tough to do. And if I may have a moment of confession, I don't know if I'm allowed to confess this kind of all over YouTube, but... Um, it's maybe a good thing that I've been seeing people through screens lately, some of them, because I know people mean well, but when they say, I hope you're taking time out to take care of yourself, I want to punch them. And so maybe it's good that I only have a screen to deal with, because I know, I know that I should, and I know that I should find time to rest and to restore, but I practically just don't know how to do that with everything going on and doing homeschool and work and all the things that are happening. Um, and so it's really, perhaps now more than ever, a challenge to rest. I think our, our lives have become so blurred. There's no distinction between work life and home life, if there ever was before. And there's no distinction between home and school. And there's no sort of fun recreational things that we can look forward to in which we find rest. We can't even go to church and, and spend time in a different place in God's presence and find those moments of rest for our souls. And so this has been really challenging for me. But as I looked through this, I was reminded again, as God, not so subtly, said to me, rest is a verb, Deline. <laughs> it's a doing word. And sometimes you have to choose to actively engage. This doesn't happen by accident. And in this new normal, I hate that phrase, but there it is. In this new normal, um, which is like different every week, the different kind of normal, but we have to find a way to find rest for our souls. And this can really only come from dwelling in the presence of the Most High. For me, physical rest is almost something that's easier because it's tangible. So I can go like, I know I'm tired and I can set aside time to have a bubble bath or do some gym or I can binge watch some Netflix or whatever and physically rest. And that is almost easier to deal with and to manage because I can see it and do it and feel it. But for me, the harder one is resting emotionally, resting spiritually in a way. Charles Spurgeon reminds us that we are called to rest in the presence of God and in the shadow it speaks of, of the Almighty. And so I love what he says about this. He says, this is an expression which implies great nearness. We must walk very close to a companion if we are to have his shadow fall on us. And so that intimacy of dwelling with God results in being able to rest in his shadow. And I know that this week is really cold, so maybe we're not seeking out the shadows, but in the heat of summer, in that desert sweltering heat in Israel, I could just imagine the cool shadow and just the comfort that that provides. I, I remember one um, time we were outside, I can't remember, some sort of event, um, and one of my kids was little, I can't remember which one was a baby, and I spent the whole sort of time we were there being a human shadow so that they wouldn't burn because I didn't have, um, I think, sunblock with me and I wasn't expecting to be outside so long. And that for me is this picture of what God does for us. We rest in his shadow and he defends us against those things that threaten us. But spiritual rest is a really tough thing. It can only come from intimacy with God. A big part of my struggle, I think, with um, all of this sometimes is that I feel like there's just too much going on for me to rest, not just in terms of work and busyness and all the things that are happening in my life, but the world is on fire. And I feel like sometimes I want to say to God, like, Lord, I can't possibly rest because there is so much that you have called us to do. As the people of God, we're meant to be the light of the world and we're meant to make a tangible difference. And you know, God, have you kind of noticed what's going on down here? Things are pretty bad right now. 
And I really feel like God led me to this again, um, to some really profound things this week. And as I went sort of down a rabbit hole and a bit of research, I came across some really amazing things. And um, I've put some links below the sermon here for you to go and have a look at if you'd like to go a bit deeper into those things. I found an incredible podcast, um, well, it's a book really, and then I found the podcast of a woman called Kate Ebola, who wrote a book called Everything Happens for a Reason and Other Lies I've Loved. And the whole book is about how um, things don't happen for a reason. And sometimes we've actually created a theology of prosperity, our own prosperity doctrine, in trying to figure out how the universe works and trying to assign logic and order to these things. But anyway, so she has this podcast called Everything Happens. Um, not for a reason, just everything happens. And on it, um, she has a great TED talk, by the way, which you can go and watch, and the link is here below the sermon. But I listened to this podcast, and on it, um, I was interested to find Gary Haugen, who is someone that I follow, and I've read some of his books, and he's an incredible person. He started um, the International Justice Mission. And so you can go and read about that. If you don't know about them, it's an incredible organization that fights for justice for victims of human trafficking and slavery. Um, and they have this amazing way of, of rescuing people, and they do just absolutely incredible work. So Gary Haugen was interviewed by Kate Bowler, on this podcast that I listened to, um, and I was so inspired by what he had to say. He is someone who has seen and continues to see day after day the worst of humanity. And I think just the evil in the world and the suffering can be so overwhelming, and the desperation around us. And there is so much wisdom in, in just some of the things he said. I wanted to, to just share two gems with you um, that they spoke about. And he really spoke about finding rest and how it is that we can deal with all these issues in the world that we face and still find a place of spiritual rest and renewal. Firstly, he spoke about doing one thing, focusing your compassion and your energy in one specific direction. He told the story of how they started International Justice Mission and they really were trying to get things going and looking at the huge scope of problems. And then they found one girl who um, had been raped and the police knew about it, but they refused to arrest the person because they were well connected and it really was a, a terrible mess of a situation. But he wrote one letter and you know got certain people involved and did all these things and that one person's case um, you know, was, was solved and they managed to, the, the rapist was arrested and, and all of this stuff happened and justice came for this one individual. And he says now he's seen it happen over 52,000 more times these individual cases that they focus on. And so he says this, abstractions are paralyzing in some ways, but there is something super powerful, I think, for those of us who feel overwhelmed by the bad and the harsh suffering in the world, to actually just pick one target, pick one place to focus one's compassion and love and see what happens. I found that to be really fruitful. And so maybe that's a challenge for you to find rest in your soul, not to be overwhelmed by all that is going on in the world, but to find one place, one person, one target of your compassion and your love where you can make a meaningful difference. The second really profound thing that Gary Hagen said was, and this is so, it really has stuck with me. It's a phrase I think I'll take with me for the rest of my life. He speaks about how joy is the oxygen of compassion. And I love that picture. Without joy and without finding ways to rejoice and to find joy and to take delight in the things in our lives, without giving ourselves permission for silliness and for laughter, our compassion will suffocate and die. He says there is a 100% burnout rate for those who are engaged with human suffering in the world if they do not attend to their own self-care. And self-care can be kind of a squishy word but it's impossible to do the work of justice sustainably without attending to the care of one's own soul. So what does that mean? Joy is the oxygen for doing hard things in the world. You have to be intentional about continually recovering joy. Continually recover joy. I know that this is maybe not at the forefront of our minds at the moment, being joyful. But what are the things that bring you joy? And how can you take a break in that? 
How can you find rest and joy? How can you actively engage in those things so that you will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty? Haugen continues and says that, in other words, seeking out joy, is actually part of doing something good in the world for a long time because the people who are suffering and hurting do not need our spasms of passion. What they need is a long faithfulness in the same direction. And it's sustained only by a discipline of joy. So what one thing can you practically do this week to cultivate a discipline of joy in your life? To dwell in God's presence, to draw near to him, to hide in his shadow, and to find joy for your soul. Matthew 11 verse 28 to 30 in the message paraphrase has Jesus saying it like this so beautifully. Are you tired, worn out, burnt out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. The yoke that Jesus asks us to carry is insanely heavy in some ways. It's the yoke of this cross that we are to take up, of compassion for a broken world. It is the yoke of sacrifice and suffering. And yet it is a yoke that is easy and light as we live in the unforced rhythms of his grace by the power of his spirit. So rest in the shadow of the Almighty One. He invites us to live in those unforced rhythms of grace no matter what is happening in the world. The third verb is say. Say of the Lord, he is my strength and my fortress. Once we've decided to dwell in God's presence, once we've consciously chosen to find rest and to cultivate a discipline of joy in our lives, we need to declare that God is our safe place, that he is our strength. Say it to yourself. Say it over yourself. Declare it in a way to make your decisions and to engage with others. Live it out in the way that you rely on God's strength and not your own. This is a proclamation of faith and sometimes we have to say it until our hearts believe it. I don't have to do this in my own strength because he is my strength. Say it over yourself all the time. And then this leads us to our last verb. We make a decision of faith as we speak this truth over ourselves. And then it leads our hearts to a place of trust. My God in whom I trust. So next week we're starting a series um, about faith because we really feel like we need to be focusing in on faith and how we have it and grow it and how we sometimes have to resuscitate it when it flounders. So we'll be talking a lot more about that in the next couple of weeks. But I love the progression that we see in these two verses in Psalm 91. When I choose to dwell in God's presence, then I can rest in him. Then I can live in the unforced rhythms of grace and joy. Then I can declare that from that place of mercy and God's protection and strength, I'm able to trust him, to take the next step in my faith with him. So my prayer for you is that as you go into this week, that you would dwell in the presence of the Most High, that you would rest in the shadow of the Almighty, that you would say and continue to be able to speak over your life the truth that He is your refuge and your strength. And may you know that He is your God, not only the great and mighty God, but your personal God in whom you can trust. So let us pray together. Father God, we pray that you would teach us to dwell in your presence, to continually inhabit that space with you where we can find rest, shelter, and peace. Grant us, Lord Jesus, the wisdom to create the discipline of joy in our lives, to find refreshing for our souls. Meet us where we are, we pray. Speak to us. Reveal more of yourself to us. We long for more. In Jesus' name, Amen. Thank you so much for being with us today. 
and we pray that you will have a really blessed week. There's a ministry song that's coming up now, and so take some time to just reflect on that and prepare your heart for communion. And then please join in and share communion with us.